What historical events are so absurd that they would be too strange for a fiction story or a movie? I got one for you. Ex-Nazi and cult leader pedophile Paul Schaefer was so obsessed with having the children of his compound, Colonia Dignidad, love him and only him that he once took all of the children of the compound to a river where he had someone dressed as Santa Claus floating on a raft. He then shot and killed Santa, in front of all the children and told them all that Santa's dead. The only holiday we ever need to celebrate here is my birthday. The Spanish conquistadors found platinum during their search for gold, and dumped all of it in the sea, because they thought platinum was inferior to silver. Oil was treated similarly before oil was useful. Wojtek, the soldier bear. He served in the Polish army in World War II, helping his fellow soldiers by carrying heavy creates of ammunition into battle, saving precious time during combat. He had been recruited as a soldier when his division had to board an English ship which didn't allow animals on board. Outraged, the Polish then made him a soldier and he lived through the war to die of old age in a zoo in 1963. An extra bit of the story is that after World War II soldiers who were close to Wojtek would hop into his exhibit bringing him beer and wrestling with Wojtek. Dot and a give him lit cigarettes, ostensibly to smoke. Wojtek was known for being a smoker, though more than one real-life account from soldiers who served with him said mostly he'd just eat the cigarettes. More than one real-life account from soldiers who served with him said mostly he'd just eat the cigarettes. Oh, so he was an officer then, got it. Douglas Bader RAF Flying Ace 23 kills, though he had previously lost both his legs in separate flying accidents. He wore a pair of clunky tin legs. He was shot down over France in 1941. The Luftwaffe were so pleased to have captured him they arranged for the RAF to drop a pair of his legs at a designated time and place, and cleared the sky for the drop to proceed. The RAF did indeed drop the legs as arranged but since all German fighters in Akak had been stood down as arranged, it seemed a waste not to bomb a nearby enemy airfield. Meanwhile, Bader stumping about on his tin legs, was a great hit with his Nazi captors. At a great party held by the Luftwaffe in his honor, he drank them under the table, excused himself to a third floor bathroom, shinned down a drain pipe and stumped off into the darkness. He was only recaptured by a German spy in the resistance. For the next four years he continually escaped and was recaptured until he was finally sent to Kolditz. After the war, there was a great spirit of reconciliation and togetherness between the air forces on both sides. Bader was not convinced. He was invited to address a crowd of assembled now ex-Luftwaffe pilots and began his speech with the words, seeing so many of you here today. I am struck by the single thought, I didn't kill enough of you bastards. One of eleven children born to Charles and Maria Sachs, Adolf was an extremely accident-prone youth who barely made it to adulthood. At three he fell three floors down bashing his head on the stone floor at the bottom. He drank a bowl of acidic water believing it was milk. He swallowed and subsequently passed a large needle. He flew across his father's workshop, and was burned badly when a barrel of gunpowder exploded. He fell upon a hot cast iron pan on a stove burning his side. He frequently slept in a room where varnished furniture was drying, somehow avoiding poisoning and asphyxiation. He was hit in the head with a slate roof tile while walking down the street. He fell in a river and nearly drowned. Then this same child, who some force was failing miserably to unalive, grew up and had the audacity to invent the saxophone. Battle of Karantzovs That time in the 1700s when the Austrian army got confused, waged a huge battle against itself within its own lines, and lost an estimated several hundred to few thousand men and a lot of equipment and money in the process. They then retreated. The Ottomans, whom they were originally intending to fight, showed up two days later. The Toronto Circus Riot of 1855 
The fire department and some clowns get into a disagreement at a whorehouse, and get into a punch-up. The clowns win, but the firemen return to the circus later and start attacking in revenge. The firemen win the day but violence is stopped when the militia come in. The police do nothing, so the city fires all the police and I mean everyone and starts a new police force. Back in the 1780s, after being elected president, George Washington decided to send a letter to Congress that basically said, Hey, looking forward to working with y'all, this will be exciting. However, George wasn't very eloquent, and was generally busy and stressed, so he asked his friend James Madison to compose the letter to Congress, which James did. When Congress received the letter, they decided to respond in kind, not wanting to slight the new president. They wanted to send back a letter that essentially said, we're glad you're excited, so are we. They decided there was no one better in Congress to write the letter than their very own, James Madison. One time I had a friend call me and tell me how she was having a conflict with someone whom she did not name and, being at different schools, I assumed I did not know. I analyzed what I thought the other party was trying to accomplish and suggested an angle to approach resolution from. The next day my other friend calls me and says she was in an argument with her friend but now that friend seems to want to make up and is asking what she can do to fix the situation. So I told friend 2 to tell friend 1 what I already prepped friend 1 to hear from a successful reply to her overture. They both thanked me later for helping them solve their problem so diplomatically. I felt like a supervillain. When Ivan the Terrible died, he had two cinch had clubbed the third one to death. The older son Theodor, who was likely mentally disabled, became the puppet of his regent Boris Udanov. The younger son, Dmitri, was sent into exile in Uglik. The accepted historical narrative is that Yudanov had Dmitri murdered in Uglik so when Fyodor died, he could usurp the throne. However, after Fyodor died, no less than three different people claiming to be Dmitri tried to take power. These false Dmitris provided Poland with the Cossus belly to invade Russia, starting a war that killed nearly half the Russian population. The first false Dmitri of Yudanov's daughter and massacred his family. He ended up almost converting Russia to Catholicism and was subsequently beaten to death by a mob and his remains fired out of a cannon in the direction of Poland. The second false Dmitri was possibly a converted Jew. Very little is known about the third false Dmitri to the point that there may have been a fourth false Dmitri or possible a false false Dmitri. There was that time when a Bolivian water company tried to quadruple the price of water and that was so comically over the top evil that James Bond Quantum of Solace had to tone it down so that their fictional version were only trying to double the price of water. The real life company were too preposterously wicked to be believable as a Bond villain. Let that sink in. May have been said already, but when Napoleon returned to France from his exile, a regiment of French soldiers were sent by the coalition powers to intercept him. Upon seeing them, Napoleon approached and simply said, If you wish to kill your emperor, here I am. The commander of the regiment ordered his men to open fire. Out of the 2,000 soldiers present, not a single one obeyed the order. They all joined Napoleon and marched to Paris with him. Truly a real-life Mary Sue at least until he was thoroughly beaten and exiled again, permanently this time. Maybe not an event, but pretty absurd. In an attempt to claim control of the former Spanish Empire's territories in the Americas, the French ruler, Napoleon III, created the term Latin America. Because if the territories were Spanish or formerly, then the French had no right to them. But if he got the world to call it Latin, which the French were considered a branch of, then Napoleon III could attempt to take them for a new, glorious, French empire. This would also reassure the British, US, and Dutch that he was not going after their American territories, since they were not Latin countries. In other words, we call Hispanics of the Americas Latin because it was French propaganda used to legitimize their rule over South and Central America. 
The assassination of US President James A. Garfield. Basically this guy named Charles wrote some essays campaigning for Ulysses S. Grant's failed 1880 nomination, and when Garfield ran for president Charles Control plus F the other politician's name and replaced it with Garfield's name. When Garfield won Charles marched up to the White House claiming to be owed some credit for that and wanted to be rewarded for his efforts by being made a consul to Vienna or Paris. He was told to scram and he was so mad that he decided then and there that he'd teach them a lesson by killing Garfield. So he went to a store and chose to spend a little extra cash on the ivory handled pistol because he thought it'd look better in a museum as the gun that killed the president. He was short a dollar so the shopkeep lowered the price. Charles then set about making plans for his eventually arrest, such as trying to tour the prison where he assumed he would be jailed. His first opportunity to kill Garfield came as the president was seeing his wife off at a train station, but Charles felt it'd be cruel to kill a man in front of his sick wife so he opted to wait. His next chance popped up as Garfield was hanging out with Robert Todd Lincoln who had a knack for being close with presidents who got killed. Charles walks up, fires and was immediately arrested. Thankfully Charles wasn't all bad and as he was being loaded up he handed the cop his gun which the cop had forgotten to grab from him. Garfield was taken back home and doctors dug around inside him with dirty fingers looking for the bullet, we'll come back to that. The Navy rigged up a makeshift air conditioner for Garfield to help with his fever and they even called in a cameo from Alexander Graham Bell to make a metal detector to find the bullet but they didn't account for Garfield being on a metal framed bed or bother to check the side of his body where the bullet was lodged. Not getting better, they sent Garfield by train to a cottage on the beach where volunteers even helped build a rail line to the cottage to make it easier. Remember how they kept digging in the wound with dirty fingers and tools? Yeah, that got infected and after nearly 80 days of misery Garfield died. Modern doctors and historians believe he would have likely been fine if they'd just treated the wound and not worried about digging out the bullet, or at the very least been smarter about getting the bullet out. Charles sat in jail until his trial where he insulted his lawyers, gave his testimony in the form of poetry, and passed notes to people in the audience asking for legal advice. He sang, he put out ads in the paper looking for a wife, and had plans to go on a speaking tour once he was found innocent. He wasn't. Charles was sentenced to death by hanging, danced his way up to the rope, and sang a song he wrote the orchestra he requested was denied. He was hanged and now part of his brain is on display in Philadelphia. <laughs>